what are the top issues serverless developers run into and how do they resolve them, Wes? Well, I don't know, Martin, but I have a feeling you're going to tell me. <laughs> you betcha. This is the 100th episode of Serverless Expeditions. We will share the top three problems we've heard about from serverless developers and how to resolve them. Hey Martin, well I've been thinking, if I had to guess, I would say user authentication is one of the top issues that serverless developers run into. And you would be right, Wes. Uh, why is authentication so difficult, do you think? Well, I suspect it's because the very first HTTP standard back in 1991 didn't say anything about authentication. As an industry, we've been playing catch up ever since, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, also, we expect more security today than back in the 90s. And that means security standards keep evolving and changing. As a developer, it can be difficult to keep up. Well, if there were only some YouTube videos that explain how to do security in a serverless way. <laughs> right, right. I was getting there, Wes. Uh, if you want a refresher on serverless security, check out these overview videos we published in the series some time ago. I will link uh, to all these videos in the description below. Well, JSON Web Tokens, or JOTs, provide a great way to authenticate end users in your backend. You and Chris shot a couple of videos about how to use them with Firebase authentication. Yeah, JSON Web Tokens, or JOT as you call them, they're great for public web applications. But for company internal apps, you probably want to block all external users and allow only internal users. Identity Aware Proxy is a great tool for that. All right, well, I've got to ask you, about authentication? No, no, about that circuit board behind you. I see it in every video shoot. What is it? Oh, this thing. Yeah, this is actually a board used by the SETI Institute, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, here in Mountain View. And they used it back uh, in the 90s. Uh, they used it to look for signals from extraterrestrials in the output of radio telescopes. Well, were the people at the SETI Institute sad to see their circuit board go? Well, they have much faster computers now. And some SETI projects uh, process their data in the cloud. Actually, we have another video at one of the researchers about that. Uh, I bought this board at an auction where the proceeds went to fund future SETI research. At the auction, I said that I was looking forward to getting this circuit board into my living room. And uh, the spouse to one of the SETI scientists said that they really look forward to getting it out of theirs. I'm sure. All right, well, that was authentication. When I'm speaking at conferences, people often ask me how to connect their serverless applications to databases. Yeah, on one hand, it's great that there are multiple databases in Google Cloud because they all serve slightly different needs. And on the other hand, it's confusing that there are so many database products. Exactly, Wes. So, uh, which are the databases we most often see serverless developers use? Well, as a developer, you first have to ask yourself if you want a relational or SQL database or a non-relational NoSQL database. Right. Relational SQL databases are good for aggregating data over many records to find averages, counts, maximums, and so on. They're also good when money needs to be stored in a database or when you have complex data models. Cloud SQL supports MySQL, Postgres, and SQL Server. But if you want a fully managed relational database with unlimited scale, strong consistency, and up to five nines of availability, you should check out Spanner. Yeah, and non-relational is good for internet scale applications when your data model is simple. Also, the NoSQL database I use most of the time, Cloud Firestore, is completely serverless. I like that. With Firestore, there's no need to provision capacity up front. I can use it for just a trickle of traffic or to access thousands of records per second. And I only pay for the operations and the storage that I actually use. Well, you shot a few videos about connecting serverless applications to databases, didn't you? Yep, some uh, popular videos in the Serverless Expedition series dealt with databases. That makes sense since almost uh, all the applications we build require a database. Yeah, but Martin, have you ever written a non-trivial application that didn't use a database? Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I have. A few years ago, I wrote a web service that provided type ahead suggestions for city names. So if the user typed S-A-N, for example, they would get suggestions back like Santiago, San Antonio, San Francisco, and so on. 
Yeah, but I, I thought you would store all those city names in a database for that. Yep, I could have, uh, but city names don't change very often. So I just put all of the names of the most populated cities in the world into a single text file. And the file came out to about 20 megabytes. And then I deployed my code together with that text file with Cloud Run. And then on startup, that code reads all those city names from the text file into memory for fast access? Yep, that's it. Keeping all the data in memory is actually much faster than accessing a database. Now, my turn to ask a question, Wes. What is that map behind you over your right shoulder? Uh, it doesn't look like any map I know. Oh, this one. Well, the reason why you don't recognize it is because it's an imaginary map. It's a map of the land of make-believe. And basically, as a child, this was in my doctor's office upstairs in the immunization center. And of course, you don't want little kids to think about getting shots in their arms. So they distract them with a map like this, where you're just like looking over that and not even thinking about getting a shot. <laughs> oh, that's a neat story. I, I actually didn't know the immunization part of the story. It's all about distracting the kids, huh? That's right. Well, now we've actually talked about two or maybe three big pain points, including the shot in the arm that kids <laughs> get uh, uh, that most developers have to deal with, user authentication and databases. But there is a third for developers. Oh, Wes, I was hoping we'd be done. No, not yet. Only one more to go. Developers often ask us how to put authentication, serverless computing, databases, file systems, and so on together to design useful systems. Oh, kind of like technical architecture? That's right. Again, Google Cloud offers many tools, and it's sometimes hard to pick the right ones and connect them correctly, especially if you're new to the cloud. Yeah, if you choose the wrong tools for your applications, uh, you might be setting yourself up for a lot of extra work. Yeah, but we've released a number of architecture videos as part of this series, and I think you shot a couple of them with Dina, right? Yep, I did. Uh, I think those episodes were useful to developers because they got a lot of views and a lot of comments, and here are some of them. Yeah, so these videos are all about designing the architecture for your app, not about coding your app, right? That's right. Well, you know me, Wes, I love coding. Uh, but in the beginning of the project, it's useful to take a step back and sketch out your application's architecture. You will save time in the long run. That makes sense. All right, time for my next question, Martin. I see two maps behind you. One looks like Scandinavia, if I'm not mistaken, but I don't recognize the other one. Yeah, Scandinavia here. And this one, uh, that one is actually a 1608 map uh, of Ireland by an Italian named Boazio. Okay, that's interesting, but it doesn't really look like Ireland. Yeah, uh, that's because north is to the right. Well, isn't north usually up on maps? Yep, uh, but this map was drawn before that was a universal convention, like it is today. Uh, back then, cartographers put north in the direction they felt like, or, or whatever fit the page better. Well, I guess there's no law of physics that says north has to be up, right? Right, right. It's just a convention. And sometimes conventions are really useful because they help us communicate. And sometimes it's useful to challenge our conventions. For example, we might build serverless systems in the cloud very differently than we'd build on-prem systems. That's right. When your code runs on a single machine, you can keep user sessions in memory between requests. And when you're using serverless, every request may end up on a different instance. So you have to put session storage on another tier, like maybe a Redis cache on a different machine. Now, I watched the video that you and Dina shot about that one. Yeah, I remember that one. That was a fun one. Uh, I find that developers who come from serverful computing often try to apply the tools and techniques they use there on the serverful, they try to use them on serverless. Uh, for example, they want to monitor server CPU. Well, and that's not really needed with serverless, is it? I mean, if Google notices that the CPU is struggling or getting too much traffic, then we automatically spin up more instances for you, right? Yep, that's right. Serverless applications are easier to manage because Google takes care of a lot of the operations work, like checking your CPU. <laughs> well, when I asked about Ireland, I knew somehow you would stick cloud computing in your answer. <laughs> yep, you, you got me, Wes. Ah, thank you, everyone, for watching the 100th episode of Serverless Expeditions. Go build useful systems in the cloud that solve real-world problems. And do it serverlessly if you can. That way, Google will configure and maintain the servers so you don't have to. Indeed. Check out the videos we talked about. The links are all in the description below. Also, please let us know in the comments what you thought of today's episode and what serverless topics we should bring up in the future. 
we read every single comment. Until next time. Mm -hmm.